I am so honored to be with you. You all look wonderful out there. I don't know if you felt as nervous of this occasion as I did, but I've been made to feel so welcome coming back to Bradford, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, it was actually in 1982 that I came here with the then thought ridiculous and impossible idea to map how nuclear weapons decisions are made in all the then nuclear nations, including China. Uh, everybody thought it was uh, totally impossible. And I came through the doors of the Department of Peace Studies at Bradford, and I was welcomed and encouraged and given the first logical steps in the process. And I shall be forever grateful for that. Um, my mentor was Professor Adam Curl, the first professor of peace studies here at Bradford. And he was a Quaker, like me, and he came with us on our delegations of Oxford Research Group to China, amongst other places. And he saw, as I did, that the Chinese leadership on nuclear weapons, that meant the physicists who designed the warheads, the military who deployed the weapons, the companies that produced the platforms for the weapons, those who signed the checks, and those who ultimately uh, launched, the, uh, launched the idea in the Chinese public. We were introduced to all these people. And uh, Adam saw, as I did, that they were as anxious as our Western counterparts to open a dialogue. And that's what happened. So um, my debt to Bradford is very great. Now, turning to today, let's face it, the world seems to be in a mess. Confused leaders stuck in old mindsets which are useless for solving today's problems, today's real problems. We have a worldwide media which thrives on reporting violence. Why? Because if it bleeds, it leads. And this means that they're neglecting, ignoring the heart-opening stories of what ordinary people are doing every day to prevent other people getting killed. And one of the examples that Donna referred to is a young woman who drew, grew up in northwest Pakistan, not the easiest place to be a woman, and she started getting young girls into school when she was only 15. That's when I first met her. Uh, and as you know, Malala Yousafzai got shot in the head for doing just that. That was her colleague. Gulalai, completely undeterred, went on to train teams of young people to work with young students in the madrasas who were being trained for jihad, go home with their parents and discuss with their parents why the Quran would not approve of suicide bombing. And they dissuaded, can you imagine it, over 200 people from carrying out their mission, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary contribution to peace. Now that's just one example of what millennials know, millennials like you know needs doing all over the world. And it's part of the reason why you're here, whatever you're studying, and that you, as I see you in this audience, are wearing your gown for all those you know who could not be here. So what you're taking away from here, from Bradford, is an immense gift to the building of a safer world. 
whether through the law, whether through economics, or whether through the fostering of peace in many ways. Now, <clears throat> this is a huge undertaking. And we're privileged because we have enough to eat, we have a roof over our heads, we have education, and nobody's shooting at us, at least not now. So if not us, who? And if not now, when? And what these um, peace heroes, that Peace Direct portraits and conveys to the world, what they're using is something that we call FQ. You've heard of IQ, you've heard of EQ, emotional intelligence. This is feminine intelligence, available equally to men as it is to women, importantly so. And the components of it, you will know. Let me spell out four of them for you. Compassion. And compassion is quite different from just getting upset when you watch the news and feeling depressed or sad about what's happening. Compassion always, the Dalai Lama says this, involves action. So compassion without action is simply emotion. Compassion with action brings about huge change because it's happening from the heart. The second one is interconnectedness. Now, through the disciplines you've learned here, you will know that we are all affecting the planet and its future, whether we like it or not, by what we do, what we eat, what we talk about, and what we consume. Interconnectedness is now to be hardwired into the way we live because everything that we're doing, and, and some people know even thinking, affects the rest of the world. So this is the time when we're entering into the possibility of regeneration of the planet. That means assisting the planet not only to go on dying as it is now, but to come alive again. And that's going to take a huge effort through law, through economics, through environmental work, and crucially, through peace building. I've just come back from the United Nations in New York, from the high level political forum, where we were addressing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. How many of you in this room have heard about the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Great, that's wonderful. Well, do you know that Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is peace, is the least invested of all the SDGs? And I got curious about this because I thought everything depends on peace, the environment, education, uh, economics, everything depends on building peaceful societies. Why? should SDG 16 have the least money devoted to it? And I realized that it didn't, the way it was described, it didn't sound very practical and very attractive. So one of the things that we're doing now in the business plan for peace is collecting examples of how to make peace building worthy of investment. And we've been talking about this at lunchtime. It fascinates me. So now I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is that most of us are dogged by an inner critic. In other words, a little vo voice that sits on our shoulder and criticizes us a lot of the time. Does anybody here have one of those? Oh, be brave. I do. Yes, that's more like it. Um, that is a negative voice that tries to undermine us. And what we have to do is walk towards it. In fact, I believe we have to walk towards everything 
that scares us. Because as soon as you run away from something that scares you, what does it do? It pursues you. And it will get you, whether it's three o'clock in the morning or next time you face a crisis. So our job is self-knowledge. That means knowing our own fear and our own anger, our own dark shadow side, because that's what makes not just great citizens, but great peace builders. All the outstanding peace builders that I know, and I could tell you stories about hundreds of them, all of them have done the inner work. They've done a daily practice of self-inspection. And that is what makes them able to be present when a crisis hits, as it does when you're building peace. It what makes them able to be there and take the necessary action because they're not overwhelmed by their fear or their self-consciousness or their worry. So I'm going to leave you with two questions and one possible answer. The first question is, what breaks your heart? Now, there's so many young people coming to me at the moment saying, I don't know what to do. The world's really in a mess. I'm desperate. I can't watch the news anymore. I feel helpless and hopeless. So I say to them, what breaks your heart? And if you can locate what it is that you mind about most, that's where your energy is. That's where your passion is. And that's what you should follow. Second question is, <laughs> and what breaks your heart might be refugees, it might be mutilated animals, it might be children in distress. Whatever it is, that something that really grips you, that you can't bear that is happening, that's where you go. That's where your energy will be. And second question is, what are your skills? Are you good at social media? Are you good at crowdfunding? Are you good at painting or drawing or telling stories? What are you really good at? What do you love doing? You match that with what breaks your heart, and that's your path. And I can guarantee that if you were feeling hopeless when you started and helpless, within a matter of weeks, you will find people gravitating to you who share your passion, who want to join you. And in a year or two, you will have a movement that you have started. It's your job and your privilege. And I think it will be your joy. Because if there's one thing I know from doing this work, it is ultimately joyful because you're following your path. Thank you for listening. Thank you.